Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm Michael David Wilson and I'm joined by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? It's going pretty good, Michael. How are you doing? All good, thank you. Today, we've got a podcast interview with Ray Cluley. Yes, this is going to be an excellent podcast. Ray's just a very, very interesting writer and he has some very, very cool things to say about writing and and his work and all that. Absolutely. And he's also one of the This Is Horror authors, as back in 2014, he released the novella Water for Drowning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's an excellent novella. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, I believe, Bob, that you have Ray's bio. Yes, I do. And this is from his website. Ray Cluley is a writer. It used to be said he was a teacher who said he was a writer. But now it's actually true. His work has been published in Black Static, Inner Zone, and Crime Wave from TTA Press, Shadows and Tall Trees from Unato Press, and Icarus from Leaf Press, as well as featuring in a variety of anthologies. Some of these stories have been reprinted for Ellen Datlow's Best of the Horror, Best Horror of the Year, Volumes 3 and 6, and Steve Berman's Wild Stories 2013, The Year's Best Gay Speculative Fiction. A couple have also been translated into French and Polish. Shark Shark won the British Fantasy Award for Best Short Story in 2013, while Water for Drowning was nominated for Best Novella in 2015. His most recent work includes Within the Wind, Beneath the Snow from Snow Books and a collection, Probably Monsters, from Cheesing Press. The collection was shortlisted for a British Fantasy Award this year. He writes nonfiction too, but generally prefers to make stuff up. All right, so before the interview, a quick word from our sponsors. Award-winning editor Jonathan Oliver presents Five Stories High, a chilling collection of stories set in the ultimate haunted house. Join K.J. Parker, Sarah Lutz, Robert Sherman, Nina Allen, and Tade Thompson as they uncover the secrets of Iron Grove Lodge in the most extraordinary horror collection of the year. One house, five chilling stories. Five Stories High is out now. Head to rebellionpublishing.com for more information. Fan favorite author David Bernstein returns with his next novella, Blue Demon, from Sinister Grin Press. With a new jazzy retro cover, this book is perfect for your horror collection. Blue Demon from Sinister Grin Press is available now in paperback and ebook. When the meat need defending, they call on Blue Demon, a guardian of bloodshed and retribution. Its loyalty is forever, as long as you remain righteous. Cal Langston knows this as he's Blue Demon's biggest television fan. But television scenarios can't be real, can they? Buy Blue Demon now and check out all the horrifying works from Sinister Grin Press. Horror that'll cover smile on your face studentsdegrinpress.com okay well with that said should we get him on the show let's do it let's get Ray on the show all right and now for a horror interview Ray welcome back to the This Is Horror podcast thank you very much great to be back again yeah, it's been over 100 episodes since we've had you on the show. So I think that also means yeah. that it's the longest gap between returning interviewees. So congratulations on that, Milestone. Oh, great. <laughs> I'll try not to take that too personally. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are some people who we haven't had back. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's a plus then. Yeah. <laughs> Is meant to be a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll take it that way. Yeah, I, I guess the biggest change since we last spoke with you is that you're now a full time writer. Um. Yeah. Well, briefly. Um. Uh, well, not briefly, but I've just gone back to full time work again now. Um, and doing the writing in the evenings. Yeah. Well, let let's talk through. The transition to full-time writer, the highs mm -hmm. and the lows of that, and then also let's talk about why you've now decided to go back to full-time work. See, if, we, yeah. if we'd have had a little bit less space between interviews, we could have done this in two separate episodes, but it's my, <laughs> it's my own fault for taking over 100 to get you back on. Uh, it's all good. I can sum it up kind of quickly anyway, so it's no problem. But then the, the transition was never like a uh, like a big break anyway. It wasn't like, um, you know, I had this big deal all of a sudden and I could then drop the job. It was just a case of 
teaching was killing me now. It's been a while. Um, I had some money saved. I'd sold the flat, so I just thought I'd take a couple of years out and focus on me for a bit, which was mostly the writing. So that's how that happened. And then, yeah, did that for a little while, quite a while. But then, yeah, found out, bizarrely, without the misery of uh, a, a job I didn't like and, and a home life that was not exactly 100%, um, I actually found writing harder. Happier. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's how it all went a bit weird. Does that make any kind of sense? Yeah, yeah, it it does. And actually, as I've recently gone full-time in terms of self-employment, sometimes when you give yourself such a freedom in terms of time and you have all this time, if you're not very disciplined, it it can be difficult to have urgency and to just get mm. the work done. And, you know, you know that, well, you've got many more hours in the day. You've got many more hours in the day after that. But if you've got a full time job, it's like, right, well, I've got an hour, maybe half an hour here. Either I write or I, I don't get anything done for the day in terms of writing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's part of it. But I mean, I mean, the passion was definitely still there. Um, there just wasn't that desperation. It mm. wasn't like, oh my god, I've got limited time now because I've just done my marking and I've got like two hours sleep if I'm lucky. So let's cram in some writing because that's right. going to be my way out. Mm. So then, obviously, I realised actually I don't have to that moment to get out. So I just got out and then could take my time. So I was I was doing like twice as many projects as before. Mm. polish them up a bit more than before and you know just a bit longer doing everything and read more mm. which was a huge plus doing. so that's probably what I spent most of my my full-time writing years doing was probably reading more than, than I was you know that in itself was really, really useful oh yeah and I mean of course it's Stephen King who says if you want to be a good writer then you've got to be a good reader so you were just banking credits in that sense yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the work was still out, but it was still just short stories, nothing mm. too too big, I don't think. A couple of novellas. I've got a couple of novels mostly done, but only at the mostly done stage, so I've got to, got to pull my finger out there and sort that out. But again, bizarrely, since since going back into full-time work now, I probably write more um, in my evenings. So, yeah, it's about just appreciating that time a bit more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, but I think it sounds like you needed to be a full-time writer to almost see what it's like and to learn that actually you work better with a job where writing is on the side. Yeah, yeah maybe. I mean, I would do it again. If I could get savings together again, I would do it again and just perhaps maybe work part-time just enough to feel the same frustration with the human world and stuff to then be able to put it on paper. Mm. But when you're just in your little bubble at home, it's you know, it's just too easy to be happy doing fun stuff. You know, you know, put, watch more films, read more books, right? More time on the Xbox, you know. Yeah, yeah. everything still had a narrative involved, but it mm. just wasn't mine. So yeah, yeah it's a bit odd. Yeah, it, I guess it can get tenuous when we try and justify playing Xbox as part of the creative process. However, in January, oh, God, Resident yeah. Evil 7 is coming out, so I will be spending a lot of time justifying that particular type of work. I mean, it's a critical horror title, so if the owner of yeah, this is yeah. horror doesn't play it, then how can I even continue to run this as horror? There's the justification. Yeah. It's well, crucial it's research. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that Resident Evil and... Um... Silent Hill were actually both really influential when I was younger yeah, um, with yeah. my love of the genre. So, yeah, yeah, they, I'd still count that. I wouldn't, I'd, maybe not just now, you know, every every zombie dead is a another little tick in my research box, but, yeah. <laughs> but no, it definitely had an impact. Certainly for myself as well. I mean, different mediums convey fear in different ways. So, I mean, what what do you think are the differences in terms of things that you can do to convey fear and to convey horror as a writer 
that you perhaps couldn't do in a video game or in an audio book or in a film and then vice versa mm. what are some of the techniques that might work in these other mediums but as a writer just don't really have the desired effect i think the biggest difference and probably the, the biggest advantage for me with writing is then the reading is the um it's the lingering effect you know you might not be scared at the time of reading but you sure as hell if it's done right think about it a lot afterwards when you can't sleep when you're in a dark place or just man it was a good book it was a good story and you just it keeps coming back whereas a game or a film for me i'm there in the moment 100 percent yeah and it, it's fantastic but i'll rarely think about it again afterwards with that same sense of fear maybe a certain fondness yeah maybe the nostalgic kind of man that game was good or it was awesome i'll put it on again mm. sometime in a month or two or something but the books they they stay i think because it's your head don't they the, the words and yeah it's just more of an emotive uh connection i think you have a, a way more uh, emotion with the characters and if you care enough about them then obviously the danger is heightened not necessarily a life or death but their sanity or whatever conflict they might be facing whether it's i don't know relationship issues whatever it is if, if you care enough about the character they can make anything mm. affect you as the reader and make it last in fact i'd say that's what I mean, differentiates between good and bad writing because you can read a, a good story and think that was a good story but if it doesn't linger then i don't think it's a great story that's why we've got the great ones that we you know we study good years after the, the author's dead because they do have that or something in there that sticks around mm. i think i'll, I'll always be a, a bookworm before before xbox before we go and you know that said they're brilliant B particularly these days is becoming fantastic i think it's a great time to be alive with Netflix around, so yeah, yeah I'm very happy with that. So to so have gone a few years without even owning a TV just because I didn't like, you know, soaps or reality or sports, to now I think God, it must go on every night. Definitely watch at least a few things on Netflix before I read or before I write or something else. Mm. The quality is just way up. It's fantastic. What you said about Netflix, I mean, I think it's been the last two or three years television shows on these on-demand platforms have just been superb to a point where it's almost overtaking film as the preferred medium for conveying a story and yeah but particularly when you look at at the quality of the actors that they're casting as well. Mm. I mean, if you think about House of Cards and Kevin Spacey, if 10 years ago you'd been told that Kevin Spacey would be in a television series, I just don't think yeah. you'd have believed it. And then... We'd, their career had taken a dive, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you've got Matthew McConaughey... You'd think they, and, they were slumming it, but yeah. Yeah, and Woody Harrelson in True Detective. Oh, man. And... Which I think remains one of the best TV series I've, I've ever seen. I think that so, I think that is what brought me back to television. More than True Detect and realizing, wow, this this stuff's out. And whilst I didn't own one, so then yeah, go out, get the TV, and yeah, like you say, all the big guys are in it. You've got Anthony Hopkins doing stuff like West. You've got you know, it's fantastic. Yeah, and. Mads Mikkelsen in Hannibal is another highlight oh, of recent years. Definitely, definitely. It's a gorgeous show. Loved that. Made me hungry. Not sure it was meant to. But yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. I was just going to say he was a fantastic Hannibal. Yes. Yeah, and I think before Hannibal, the television series, if you'd have asked somebody, should we do something with... Thomas Harris's Hannibal material after Anthony Hopkins, people would have said, let's just leave it alone. But Mads Mikkelsen and the team behind Hannibal showed us that there was room for something that not only could be in the same league as Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal, but possibly overtake it. Yeah, 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 I think so. So uh, I did nuances to it and a bigger audience it was definitely horror but you've got a generation now that probably watched it thinking it was crime uh, 
fell in love with it. Might have I mean, read more horror movie, I don't know. Mm. But yeah, really a, a, an amazing reimagining of that whole thing. And I'm a big fan of Harris's books as well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I had no problem, no problem in that, that imagining of it. I thought it was absolutely gorgeous, gorgeously shot. You had some wild, grotesque scenes that it's just exquisite. And it, it, the way he prepared it, or knowing what was going in that meal, it just, everything was just divine. But again, characters were the, the big, the big deal for me. Hannibal and Will Graham, just seeing the, the interactions between them two, um, wonderful, mm. Ooh, wonderful TV. I loved it. That was probably the and closest this, that anyone's ever come to really capturing Hannibal Lecter from what Thomas Harris and from the from the stories, because Lecter's character was Lithuanian. So you have you know Mickelson, you know who I think grew up in Lithuania. So you know you, you have have this. I don't know. It's a very close representation of the character. Probably more so than with Hopkins and, and, and Brian Cox, both great in their roles mm-hmm. uh, with Manhunter and, you know, Silence of the Lambs. But Matt probably got it as close as possible. Yeah, I'd go with that. He got the, the intellectual edge on it, which was brilliant um, as well. You know, everything about the setting, the study being library, his pursuits with the drawing, the books, with everything else. That ego, yeah, he couldn't be bored and he had to play with people and it was all just entirely for his own amusement. <laughs> That's what makes him such a scary character. It was just, it was just for, for the fun of it. Um, That's dark. It's really dark. Perfect. And I think he captured the essence of the sociopath. I mean, the fact that <laughs> despite everything he did, he was a genuinely likable and charming guy. There was there was <laughs> yeah. something, yeah. you know, very attractive about him in terms of his personality, in terms of his mannerisms. If you didn't know that you might end up on his plate, you'd think, mm-hmm. yeah, all right, I'll 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 go to dinner with him. I'll spend some time yeah. with the guy. Yeah, you come across as a good friend to have a lot of the time. But yeah, the danger would be... Like you say, either ending up on the dinner table or doing stuff that you think was your idea wasn't in the slightest. You know, you've been manipulated or pushed into certain situations just because that's what he does. But yeah, yeah very, very likable. Yeah. Even at the end, you know, after three seasons of him, at the end, you still him. So successful writing, I think, that. Yeah. Well, so much with him that there was a, a big uproar, certainly within the genre community, when. It was announced that it wouldn't be renewed for a fourth season. Yeah, kind of glad in a way because I find that seasons tend to they get diluted, don't they? And they they yeah. weaken. But in this instance, I think it could have it could have done with another one because I think some of that third season felt a bit rushed. Let's try and cram in a lot of stuff all of a sudden because there's so much we want to cover. Um, I think it benefits maybe from one more. But oh well. Yeah. At least it didn't go on for nine or ten and, you know, everyone hate it, so that's good. I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was around the time that they just started season three that they announced there wouldn't be a season four, so I wonder if that's why they crammed a lot in to what would be the final season. What were the reasons? Because it must have had a lot of viewers. Well, it it was to do with ratings. I mean, they had a lot of viewers in terms mm. of a horror show or a dark crime show, but the reality is that they're just looking at ratings across the board, and you know, it wouldn't. Yeah. So they wanted in, another X factor or something. Yeah, well, it wouldn't bring in the ratings that say like a kind of feel good, romantic comedy series or just something with a little bit of a wider appeal would have but i i think for what it was doing it had a wide appeal when you yeah, consider yeah. what it was the genre it was how dark it got but it's all about the money unfortunately unless you yeah. go with a with a smaller more independent network and who who's to say in a number of years that it won't be picked up and there will be another outing? It's it's possible. I mean, 
they've announced that there's going to be a new season of Prison Break, and I thought that was long gone. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if um, Twin Peaks kind of opened the door a bit there. <laughs> yeah. Go back to all seasons, because, you know. The X-Files. And the X-Files, yeah. Yeah, doing that again. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as a fan of the originals, there's obviously a big part that wants to see these new series but as you mentioned ray there is a danger that if you go on too long or if you reboot something when it really didn't need to be rebooted that it can just end things on a sour note and then you wish they hadn't touched it at all because they've kind of damaged the the memories and the reputation of that series yeah in fact, I haven't watched the um, the new X Files yet for that reason, just because I'm a bit worried that it will ruin the memory of it. And I heard such mixed things on like social media and stuff about about the, the short run that it had. I mean, it's only like what was it six episodes or something like that? I think it was six episodes, and I think that only really three of them had any real continuity to them. And there were three kind of off the wall episodes. They had one that was like a homage to the Night Stalker, you know. Uh, and I, for the same reason, that's why I don't watch. I watched one. I thought it was well produced, but it to me it just I don't know that that exciting feeling that oh man X is coming back and then you watch it and you kind of go mm, maybe it'll get better, <laughs> you know. So I quit watching. I had other things. I probably will at some point. Yeah, I'm in the same situation, you know, as as Ray in that. I'd like to watch it, but I've I've put off watching it for now. There was a mixture of reactions, and it, there's a lot of great television that I can watch at the moment. So maybe I'll I'll wait for a drought, and then yeah, then I'll go to go to the X Files when the hype or lack of hype has died down. Well, we have a question from. Our Patreon, and this is from Jake Marley, and he wants to know about your writing process, particularly when it comes to short stories. And that ties into something that Bob and I wanted to ask about, which is about the research that goes into your stories. So, if possible, I wondered if you could talk us through a story from the very start of the idea to the finish and with the kind of time frames and stages that you go through. Yeah, it varies a lot, I think, for me. And that's one of the appeals of short stories is that it, it can vary and not have too much of an impact on, on any sort of fixed routine. Um, I think maybe the quickest one was probably beachcombing, um, which was literally, it was... Uh, uh, image of some folded clothes on a beach. I just liked that image in my head, and uh, I just was thinking, well, how did those clothes get there? And and then I realised that the reason that those clothes were there were to do with this particular character. But I wasn't interested in his side of the story. I wanted to see somebody else's side viewing this character, and then and that gave me time. And I think I probably plotted it all out in my head in half an hour or so, and then wrote it all in one thing, which is the only time I've ever done that with a story. I wrote that all in one sitting, um, read it aloud straight after it was finished, and then went back to it the next day, polished it up, sent it off. And that's probably the quickest one. But that's that's rare. I've just gone with that. I've had maybe the image as starting a few times, but never one that has just been plotted out so quickly and then written down in sort of like this white heat. Um, you a way slower process. Um, I mean, I can work for ages on a story, like a year or so. Not every day. Maybe researching around it, then letting it settle for a little while, finding ideas that connect to it. I mean, at the moment, I'm writing one. Well, I've been writing one for the last few months, um, as on an invite anthology, and um, it's all to do with uh, the sea. I can't say too much about it, but it's the sea, which is one of my favourite sort of environments for stories. So naturally, I've got quite a few story outlines already planned for that. So for that process, it was just a case of going through them all, finding if there's one there that shone a bit brighter than the others or connected to the others. Um, and then just doing an awful lot of reading, reading some great books on sea monsters, some great books on um, 
different parts of the world because I like to set my stuff all around the world if I can um, because I like the research part I find that you know one of the most interesting parts of the process so it's good about other cultures and other countries and then trying to put that in your own writing in a convincing way hopefully a convincing way mm. um, if you think you can't do it in a convincing way then maybe let's stick an English guy in the place and uh, that way you can do it from a foreigner's perspective but that's a bit of a shortcut a bit of a lazy way but you know no fixed routine I do tend to write from beginning to end I know some people chop and change and go around it but I do tend to even if I get to a point where I'm stuck I might just jump forward a little bit and continue to write. I won't go to the end first and then try and get to the end by writing the beginning, like I know some writers do. I also find that some people plot it in quite a lot of the, you know, the postcards or this happens and then this mm. happens, this happens. I've done that a few times, but I find if I do that too much, it kind of it kills the story a little bit for me. Um, I can still write it and I can still get it down on paper, but there's there's not as much joy there, which I worry shows probably in in the writing itself. I like to have a little bit of them to make it up as I go along, even if I know roughly where it's going. I don't. I don't want to know every in and out of it. I don't know if that's answering the question, really. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, if you find you're making it up as you go along, as opposed to following a systematic postcard process, then I suppose you might find that the situations and solutions to problems become that bit more creative because you're having to think mm. on your feet, particularly if you get yourself into a situation where you're almost stuck. You have to come up with something quite imaginative to get back out of that again. Yeah, I've had a novel stall because of that. Um, I, I had it all planned out. It was supposed to be this, this fire on a, on a barge and my character was supposed to go into this after the fire and sift through the remains and figure stuff out. And I'm writing the scene where it's burning, and next thing I know, he's jumped the balcony and he's running into the, this burning barge, and he's and I'm like, "What are you doing? What are you doing this for? This isn't the plan." And then <laughs> after that, I couldn't continue that story. I was like, "What? You ruined everything." Uh, it's that classic, you know, where right you say that the character took over. And I know that's you know, there's a little bit of a metaphor there, but this one particularly felt like he did, and uh, yeah, that that died then. I will go back to it one day, I think. But no, for me, a lot of the, the writing is actually in the reading. I think think um reworking it so you're trying to avoid the obvious you've written a story and you think yeah okay that's done but if you then look at it and think well what change this character's gender or what if i just change the perspective here or you know, things like that and you find you, you can sometimes have a completely different story and a, and a much better story than the one that came to you the first time and, and i love it when that happens i i'm just imagining w with your story where the character <laughs> runs into the fire i mean you could just have it set up like it's going to be this novel length work and then because he's decided to run into the fire you're like well you know what he runs into the fire he burns to death at the end he did that don't yep. blame he's gone. don't blame me he did that <laughs> it looked like it was going to be a novel i agree i thought it was too but then he decided to set himself alight. <laughs> so that's what you've got. <laughs> and he died, the end. Yeah, yeah exactly. that, that could work. Yeah. There you go. I do often think about it, though, because I think, well, he's still there. You know, he's, he's, in mind, he's still in that fire at the moment, trying to help people, waiting for me to just get on with it and tell him what to do next. Yeah, he's probably um, pretty which angry. Which is sort of an odd feeling. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be pissed when you get back. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> just be sitting there with his arms folded yeah not doing nothing but um yeah i mean it's rare that they take over yeah what what we're talking about reminds me of something that i read in an interview that you you had i can't remember who it was with but you said you hoped that on your gravestone would be written end of part one because you're an optimist oh that's right could that be the ending? <laughs> that that could just be the ending to part one of that story. I don't know what happens yeah. after, but yeah, that's your first act. Could be. I could just fast forward a few years or something. God, if I don't go to hell, hell for me might be that burning barge. Yeah. Character. Yeah. Not knowing what to do. Yeah, and as 
Bob said, I mean, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do when you get there because he's going to have yeah. been in the fire for goodness knows how long. I do grow a little, you know, um, disturbingly attached to my characters, actually, which is probably why I do think about him stuck there in that fog. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a long time. And I still feel it now, actually. I feel guilty when I kill characters off um, to the point where I had to write a short story about the place where dead characters go. Um, because I didn't like the idea that that was it, they were done. So they, they kind of go to this suburban heaven um, where they just live out forever there um, until I join them one day, I think. But, yeah, I do feel... I need a psychiatrist, I think. I need a therapist of some kind because <laughs> that's that's not normal, is it? They should just be devices to tell a story, but they're not really. <laughs> I I love the idea that you do go to heaven and you realise that every single character you've created is there with you. So I suppose, depending on what you write, determines whether you're in heaven or yeah. hell. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they won't all be there. Yeah, yeah there's a few I wouldn't like to be. <laughs> so they they all gang up on you when you show up you know yeah, that would be bad you bastard <laughs> you had me in a house on fire forever <laughs> that would be bad i really wouldn't want to meet the guy from um oh god i'm forgetting the names of my own stories now okay man go wouldn't want to meet him for those of you that haven't read the story he, he sticks a model uh actually no i'm not even gonna tell you because it's just weird out of context Let's grab this bit from the Air podcast because that's just too weird. I don't want to ever meet him. James, that was his name. James. No, I like I like the idea of keeping it, and it's like he sticks. Uh, <laughs> you're never gonna know. <laughs> you better read it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's an odd one. Yeah, I felt quite bad because I named that character um, after James. Actually, no one no one knows this, so he is exclusive for you. I named that character after. Um, James Cooper, who I absolutely love as a writer, he's he's brilliant. He's a really nice guy as well. And um, I was stuck for a name, so I was looking around my bookshelves, and I thought, oh, oh James Cooper, of course, James is bloody brilliant. I'll use James. Um, and at this point, I didn't know quite where that character would end up. So sorry, James, if you if you're listening, if you have read that story, he, he started out as a as a sort of honor of you. He's certainly not you at the end of the story. So. <laughs> And what was the name of the story? I think it cut out when you were telling us. Um, it might have cut out or I might have just not told you. I'm trying to remember it myself now. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if, if you don't know, yeah, then you clearly bad, didn't tell us. No, I'm just trying to remember if I even said because now it's gone. See. Anyway, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is a cautionary punished. lesson. If you write too much, then you... Can't remember what you said one minute ago, so let that be a warning to our listeners. Well, it's, yeah, maybe if you have too many, many projects on the go at once. <laughs> oh, the story was pins and needles. That was it. Ah. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah, pins and needles with James. And if people want to read that, is that in your collection? Probably monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's in there, um, and it's in. It was in Blackstaff originally. But talking about, yeah, you were talking about um, the story process. That was an odd yeah. one because that was, uh, I had an idea about a guy who was obsessed with rocket ships. That was our friend James. Mm. Um, but I also had another story that was a, about a guy that was obsessed with with guns, um, and, and needles. And, and so that came from having seen a student, uh, when I was a student, and just laid some pins out on a wall somewhere. You know, the classic joke of waiting for someone to sit down on those pins. Mm. And I thought, what if a character had a compulsion to just always do that? You know, got off on that. Like to talk to people putting themselves on drawing pins or needles that he'd hidden in seats on the bus um, and things like that. Um, and I realised it wasn't quite a story on its own, but Neil was my rocket ship obsessed guy. But then when I put the two together, I suddenly had this this nice new entity and, and the rest of it wrote itself from then on. James became way more disturbed, um, mm. and the story got the ending that I did not plan to have until probably the last, I don't know, the last few hours. I suddenly thought, oh, of course, that's where it's got to go. That's got to end. So that's what I did. It's weird though, because that story is the first one that ever got a very strong negative reaction, um, which was great. Stuff. Most people loved it, um, which was which was nice. It's always nice. But I remember one guy ranting about it on the TTA forum. Um, right. He used block capitals and everything. He was that angry. He used block <laughs> oh, <capitals dear. laughs> and uh, went off about how much he absolutely 
hated it. I think because of the way I painted James out to be a particular character, he took offense at the way I'd done this character. Um, cause he was into his models in his space in his Star Trek. And I think he thought I was taking a, a nerd stereotype to. I wasn't. I was having fun with it. I mean, I was that guy. You know, I used to do all that stuff. So it's not like I was taking out of a sort of any sort of subculture. I wasn't doing a big theory on it. So yeah, he was very passionate, but mostly it was well received. But yeah, different processes. Sometimes stories come together. I was going to say it's funny when people recognize qualities in a character that they themselves have and then just make this wild assumption that because something bad happens that you're then kind of stereotyping or or poking fun at those particular types of people when it's like, well, yeah. no, it's just a, a character. He had to like something. <laughs> it doesn't mean that everyone yeah, yeah. who likes that is going to behave in the way in which James did. It, it's, that there's no correlation. No. But then I'd rather have a, a way out there angry reaction than just a meh. It was all right. So. Well, yeah, I, and we, we've said that before. If you get a lukewarm reaction, that's the worst kind of reaction for just everyone to say, yeah, it was okay. It did what it was meant mm. to. But, yeah, they're not particularly moved either way. Much rather have someone really angry or really happy with it. Yeah, I can't. Well, they make assumptions about characters like this guy did. Or I had one review where someone had said that they uh, they'd abandoned one of my stories halfway through because they didn't like the portrayal of this particular character. Um, they did at least have the the common sense to say something else might have happened in the story to change this, but I left it here, kind of thing. Mm. Um, and a bit of a shame because something does happen. Uh, I can't say too much without ruining the story, but yeah, yeah, annoyingly. Why this reader had quit was actually addressed and was one of the main points of the story up to that point. It's just I maybe pushed that particular reader a bit too far. If she'd have stuck with it a bit longer, she'd have had the big reveal and been like, oh, right, see what you're doing there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, a risky take. You've got to be true to the story, haven't you? Yeah. You just tell the way it has to be told. And if you lose a few readers, then so hopefully you gain more than you lose. Yeah, and, and, and surely this is what good writing and good art is all about. It is about pushing people's boundaries and pushing the limits in terms of what you're doing. So if you lost someone along the way, probably it's testament to you doing things properly. Yeah, I hope so. I and mean, she did read the rest of the collection as well. So it was just when she was writing the review up that particular story but she didn't finish it but I was like okay that's fair enough can't force you to read the whole thing oh there's a story there I suppose that's interesting all the different things different ideas different ways stories come together and different ways they affect people it's weird I don't know if I've ever had one affect me no no I don't think I've ever had a character so much I've had to stop reading a, a book or a story mm. well I'm currently Reading Money by Martin Amos. Have you read that? No, no. Any good? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think. What that doesn't sound too, it, 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 <laughs> well, it's not too promising. Well, so this this was recommended to me years ago by George Tooley, my creative writing pr professor at Warwick, and. It's because we were talking about comedy writing and dark comedy and the protagonist is just profoundly dislikable. I mean, he's a misogynist, he's a racist, but he's, he's, and it's all told in the first person as well, but he, he's so abhorrent that it, it can make the story difficult to enjoy, and yet it is, it is very well written. It is entertaining at times, but but sometimes it's just going so far. And it, I don't know, it's quite a controversial book. I'm I'm seeing it through, but we'll have to see, we'll have to see how it ends, and then after. 
I've read it all of it. I'll be looking more into Martin as a person as well. Because, I mean, actually in the last episode with T.E. Grau, I was talking about yeah, how you have to separate the art from the artist. But in spite of that, if there's someone who's so objectionable and so well painted in that light, even though you separate the art and the artist, you might want to research, okay, is, yeah. is, does the artist share some of these views? Because, I mean, if you find out they do, again, this came up with Ted, it can be challenging in terms of do you actually want to support them going forward, particularly when there are so many great writers out there who don't yeah. have these objectionable views. Yeah, I deliberately don't find out now. Mm. Um because I remember I, I saw an interview with um, James Elroy. I really don't like him at all. And it's put me off his novels, which I used to enjoy. There's, there's no reason for it. I, I can separate the art from the artist, and I could probably pick up his novel and still enjoy it. But then I kind of think, well, why? Why put money in his pocket? I can read this book instead by this guy who, you know, might be all right. I'm not going to go and research him just in case he is. Yeah, uh, it's weird, but you do worry about it. I, I worry about it. But if you're writing in this genre, because you're going to be writing some very, very despicable characters, mm. and you've got to make it convincing. And sometimes, you know, you do have to maybe open doors you wish you didn't have <laughs> in your personality or your brain, and go to places that you you are kind of ashamed you have. But a lot of the time, you don't do that. A lot of the time, you are just making something up. A lot of the time, you're thinking, well, what do I hate? What what do I abhor? What do I absolutely uh, find? repelling and then I'll put that in a character and that's my way of dealing with something but then you know how that's going to be received so mm. and there's a story of mine that Jess can't stand just because the guy in it is racist he's a he's a he's a piece of work he's not a nice guy at all uses the n-word a lot and things like this and she can't she doesn't like reading it she doesn't like reading something that I've written that's that horrible yeah um, never mind that you know he gets them up and all this you know there is a payback to it but yeah, so sometimes it's a bit difficult, isn't it, to disassociate? Yeah, I, d I think it's it's probably easier to write and to read about an appalling character in a short story setting, particularly if it's in the context of a wider collection. But I mean, mm -hmm. it must it must be exhausting to write about such an unrelentingly nasty character for the length of a novel. I mean, that must take yeah, it out of the writer a lot as well, to spend that amount of time with the character. Yeah, it must do. I mean, because there are novels that I've read that do this, they take it out of me as the reader. And I just mm. think, God, the writer had to go through several drafts of this as well and live inside this character's head for a while. It must have been... Before, to the point where I can't always read. I mean, for example, Chuck, I can never pronounce his surname. Is it Patrick Falanuic? Whatever. Fight Club and Choke and that lot. How do you yeah. pronounce his surname? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's... Is it Paul O'Nick? I don't know. We, like, we okay. could have a whole fucking podcast. <laughs> I've, always, I've always heard it's just... It's Paula. Nick. Paula yeah. Nick. I can read like one of your books and enjoy it, but I, I can't read another one for a long time afterwards just mm. because they're usually so bleak and nihilistic characters in there and I just think no, I can't not not as not at novel length anyway I can read some short ones yeah well someone who does objectionable characters incredibly well is Nathan Ballingrude yeah yeah but I, you know I've read only at short length then so you can kind of deal with it a bit but those are fantastic though aren't they <laughs> undeniably brilliant stories yeah well I I I, I think he's one of, one of the best writers out there today. Full stop. In, yeah, a, in any genre, he, he is just one of the best writers out there. Yep. Yeah, it must be exhausting for him because if you read North American Lake Monsters, then I, I think pretty much every story is dealing with these nasty characters, but they're all painted in shades of grey as well. So despite... Yeah. Despite them being objectionable, there's always something redeemable about the character 
I mean, not so redeemable that I'd want to go for a drink with them, but yeah, you know, yeah. They're, they're not just like black and white. This character is evil. There's something more, as there always is in good writing. Yeah, that's a fantastic collection. It's, it's one of those where when you've read one of the stories, you're like, that one's my favourite. And yeah. then you read the next one, and you're like, no, actually, that one's my favourite. Yes. And you do it through the whole book. And it's, that's just, it's just fantastic. Yeah, no, just just t- talking about it, I want to go back and reread it now. Yeah, I, I mean, one of them in there, Sunbleached, I think it's called, the, yeah. the vampire one. Yeah, yeah. It, one of the best vampire stories I've I've ever read, ever. And it was just so refreshing at that time when I read it because there was a lot of sparkly twilight around at the time as well that it was just nice to go back to that kind of monstrous type. But what he does particularly well for me, he, he writes about sort of, complex issues around masculinity really well yeah involved there especially in a world that doesn't can't relate to that old-fashioned view anymore about what is masculine what makes you a man and all this mm. they're, they're very complex characters usually dealing with those issues and, and it's nice to see that i love that but yeah they're not very nice yeah and sun bleached is often one of the stories that i reference if we're talking about taking old tropes and reinventing them and coming up with a fresh and original idea. I think it's Sunbleach yeah. that I'll reference for vampires and then often mongrels by Stephen Graham Jones in terms of their werewolf trope. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. I read that one. Y'all have me at a disadvantage. I haven't read that collection yet. Oh, you I'm must. going to now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, is, it is phenomenal. It's fantastic stuff. And read the visible filth as well. That's just superb. Just to care. Oh yeah, definitely. That that's that's great. Bit of a this is. I just realised awkwardly there that that's a this is horror plug on the this is horror podcast. But it is it is fantastic. Oh, was that was that not intentional? You you accidentally? No, no, no. It's it, yeah. It's, it was accidental because I love that. That was a fantastic one, and one of the, the rare ones that unnerved me. So it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, no, that. That's great, and I, I know something that I particularly liked last year, and it's actually happened a few times this year as well, is with the This Is Horror Awards, when someone accidentally nominates a This Is Horror title, <laughs> and I, I remember uh, there, was, there was a discussion on Facebook where someone last year, I don't know who it was, they were getting... They were actually quite angry that the visible filth hadn't been nominated for novella of the year, and so I had to step in and say, "Well, we published it. I mean, can you imagine if I'm like, right, well, let's see this year well, I think t Grau and and Josh Malaman wrote some good novellas for us, so that's in the category and Podcast of the year, yeah, yeah, we're over a hundred episodes now. I think it's our time. <laughs> That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, win our uh, own award. Yeah, I'm just gonna <laughs> also introduce outstanding genre contribution. I'll I'll put myself and Bob up for that, so you can decide who your favourite is. <laughs> Get your non-fiction category as well, can't you? See. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think. I mean, might... you probably you have to admit when you see your own title, because I mean, you get the other nominee. It probably gives you a little sense of pride. But you're like, yes. <laughs> it, yeah, it, As you know what? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's nice, and I've well, some people nominated the This Is Horror podcast and the Out a Dark podcast for podcast of the year and I think well I could see how you could accidentally nominate the Outer Dark but come on the clues in the name of the This Is Horror podcast I don't know if it's just (laughs) flattery (laughs) I know Bob you had a question that you wanted to ask and it was specifically related to Trapper's Valley and we, we touched on it before but just in terms of the writing and how authentic it is Right, and it's you know reading reading the story, you know it's, it's set it's set in Alaska, and it, I, I believe I'm there. I love it when writers can can do that, and it's you know at my first thought is oh he's probably been there, maybe not. So then it led me to thinking okay, so when you do research into areas that you've never 
been to and trying to incorporate it in and you know without doing a info dump you know mm-hmm. exactly what's what's the what's the process there i mean yeah you know, i don't and like i said i don't even know if you, you have actually been to alaska i don't know and i would absolutely love to because i'm i love cold places that next to the sea i think they're my favorite sayings um so alaska and iceland and greenland and i'd love to do that any of the, the netherlands and stuff um but no it's just an it's just an awful lot of research but i enjoy it so it's fine so i, I mean i read i think for that particular one i read a whole book about homesteaders and people who were you know taking property out there right up until i think sort of the end of the 70s that was still you were still able to just go and claim land um but i read about that and how hard it was to give up a lot of the uh the comfortable stuff to hack your so to speak but yeah with that added one i you know i have some new orleans as well and i don't know the first thing about new orleans except for the, the big stuff that you always see you know what it what it looks like in some of the cultural things so again lots of reading um lots of magazines um for that one i went on youtube a bit and listened to the people talk um which was really useful actually because there's a lot of dialect aspects I, I wouldn't have thought of if i just read books about the place i mean there's there's an example she gets a little head wound i think in the story and she just says oh it's just a hickey and you know over here a hickey is like a love bite it's, it was weird writing that sentence but listening in the research to people they just call little bumps to the head hickeys and i was like okay i'll chuck that in. that's a nice tip detail it's just fine those, those weird bits that's that's always been more compelling than chuck a load of facts in so but i, I mean i love that one so much i love the research there so much that i've actually got another three stories set up for that same uh sort of region which i'm really looking forward to doing i'm just waiting to see how well received trappers is in the first place to see if it's worth cracking on with them anytime soon or whether i just do it for my own pleasure a little bit later on but yeah it's a lot of lots and lots of reading lots and lots of note taking making sure i don't copy anything uh, and <laughs> that's pretty much it uh and i love i love the app where you watch youtube videos especially like concerning new orleans uh you know my family's uh i'm half cajun or kunas right. as we prefer to call it. and you know you, if you get someone kind of an outsider that you know they think okay louisiana new orleans it's all the same and it's not. There's a huge difference. New Orleans has an accent that is almost, at, at a very first listen, you would think that person could possibly be from New York or the Upper East Coast. It is, it is a very, very uh, different uh, cultural ac- accent that they have. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, man, I, I, you know, I've always thought about that because I like to write about different characters, you know, especially people not not from in Texas, so not from Texas. And man, that just gave me a great idea just, you know, to try to possibly find YouTube videos to where I can see how oh, to face. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, this this was great. This was literally just, I think I typed in something like New Orleans dialect or, or something like that. And it was about 10, 15 minutes of just someone interviewing various people in the city. What do you call this? What do you call that? What do you refer to this? And, you know, and it's little things that I've made assumptions about, like everywhere in America is the sidewalk, for example, and it's like, it's not. You know, they didn't call it that. I can't remember what they called it now, but it wasn't the sidewalk. It wasn't the pavement. It was something else. And, right. But you also get to hear all these different people, and accents and dialect played a, a major part in that. And it was just interesting as well. It's just, you don't get that off a page. So it was nice to see real people talking and then try and capture some of that. But, you know, I had my work cut out for me with that one a little, little bit because about two places I'd never been with a female character as the lead who's black so it's like everything that i'm not and then it's just it was it was one that i had to try and hopefully i've got it right but it was one that i had to research a lot beforehand well so from when i've read it it's it's, it's good it's good you, you nailed it and you had you had a good challenge you accepted the challenge you made the challenge i had to be boring otherwise i just wrote what i know that whole write what you know thing you know is a bit it's crappy advice you know know what you you're right would be better just make sure you do the research and then then write it um otherwise everyone i ever do is going to be some white middle class ex-teacher guy who's right struggling to get on with people <laughs> let's write another i know some writers do that well you, you know and they can really have a niche out in a, a certain locale or a certain type of character that they write about again and again but that would bore me and i would give up writing pretty soon i think so i have to 
I have to go to Africa and I have to go to North America and I have to go to Asia and my stories. Otherwise, I'd just be bored. Mm, yeah. But horror is worldwide. So <laughs> I like yeah. to be able to. There's that weird dichotomy that horror is everywhere and uh, people are the same everywhere you go. And yet there's so many differences too that can be way more interesting than if I was to keep setting it in my own backyard. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we put, we put so much of ourselves into the story. It, it makes sense to put a little bit of someone else into the story as well. And I, I think you got that, you know, you got that part down for sure. You know, uh, I, and I, it, it gets boring writing about the same kind of people all the time. And so it's, it's, it's refreshing, you know, uh, to me, I, I, I love dialects. I love studying dialects and stuff like that, but I never thought to use YouTube, man. I'm, oh, I'm going there now. <laughs> oh yeah. That's brilliant. I've just been doing that a lot actually recently. I'm writing a story about, um, a whaling ship. Um, the whole thing is about whaling. And usually I would just read it as I could on that. And I thought, hang on, YouTube again. And, um, there's so many videos where it's just filmed on board as they're whaling and you can hear the men talking about what they're doing and you can see the job firsthand. And it's, it's fantastic because it's not even a nicely polished sort of planet earth version or anything like that. It's just people with phones half the time or, you know, things like that filming stuff mm-hmm. is way more every day. You get those little, little details you might not have noticed before. So yeah, fab, totally recommend it. Yeah, it's probably a lot more than reading Moby Dick. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I've done, I'm doing that as well. <laughs> but, yeah, that... It's been a long a long time since I read that one. I always think I'm gonna reread Moby Dick one day. Yeah, it's weird. It's been on my to read list for ages, but now that I'm writing a story, it's kind of it's up the top there. It's just good. <laughs> for those that want to read Trapper's Valley, I don't think we've actually told them how to. So it's going to be in the new Crime Wave issue. Am I correct in thinking that? Yep. Yep. It's in the next Crime Wave. Um, and currently, I've just seen an advert in the latest Black Static that says it'll be mailing out soon. So that one will be available um, pretty shortly. It'll be this year or the beginning of next, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it looks like a good one to be in. Lots of good names in there. I love Crime Wave anyway. It's it's a fantastic. Yeah. Do you know which number? I think, I want to say 13, but that might just be the last one that I was in. So um, let me just see how far this lead stretch, because I can just walk over to there. Yeah. Yeah, crime, crime is part of the, what is it? That's also another, that's a TTA press yeah. Uh, publication. Yeah, because yeah, I picked up your uh, your inner zone, Ray, with your uh, story mm-hmm. in there. And then I have, uh, I just subscribed to Black Static. And I, I'm a, I'm awaiting my first issue. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, we've been revealing yeah, but... it. So I've been getting like spoilers. Like, damn, I need to get this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are great. I have been as much uh, a TTA press writer for a long time started and it's it's usually where i see stories first as well as to black static or into zone crime wave you know great people started in those places you know, joe first story i think was a crime wave story and is it uh michael from michelle babe i can never pronounce his name properly i think he was a crime wave guy first but it's good because the crime stories were just that little hint of something odd something mm. weird sometimes a bit supernatural i like that little Extra bit of flavor in there. It's nice. It ties back to True Detective season one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's why I like that one so much. And Dad watched the second one actually, yet in case it isn't quite the same. But that little occult flavor was just good, I think. Right. I think that if they, they would have pushed it over too far, they would have, they would have lost people. I think what, what, what makes it work is the fact that they don't go into it that deep. And season two has no occult overtone at all. I mean, uh, it's good. Not as good as the first season, but it's still good. I guess I will give it a go. But yeah, I mean, in the first season, that restraint, I thought, was was beautiful. And again, it's about character. It was more about seeing the way they interacted for me. Exactly. Um, plus, the structure of it was just so perfect. You know, having the flashback narratives, revisiting the story after however many many years seeing the two very different versions of the men it was was, was brilliant that was part one of our interview with Ray Cluley 
do tune in next week for part two. And of course, if you head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror, you'll get early bird access to that second part. Before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Greg Gavion, critically acclaimed and award-winning author, is the master of writing books that will scare and entertain you. His latest, Savages, from Sinister Grin Press, will take you on an island adventure you'll never forget. Seven friends lost at sea eventually happen upon an island, but this paradise is not what it appears. Secrets start long buried and forgotten surface, and the evil that guards them will stop at nothing to protect the island from those intruding on its dark legacy. Savages is available at most online retailers and paperback and ebook. Grab Savages today and watch for all the horrifying works from Sinister Grin Press horror that'll cover a smile on your face. SinisterGrinPress.com 378 Collar Mill Road looks like an ordinary house, but this is no house. This is a portal between worlds. Alice Collier was happy here once, but now the walls are closing in and the darkness on the other side of the hill threatens to break through. Uncover loss and legends, secrets and ancient mysteries in Simon Beswick's The Feast of All Souls, out now. Head to rebellionpublishing.com to find out more. So you may have noticed this episode that we've welcomed on board two new sponsors, Solaris Books and Sinister Grin Press, both of which are putting out some of the finest titles within the genre. If you're a fan of short stories, then do check out some of Solaris's Jonathan Oliver edited anthologies, things like House of Fear, and the end of the line. They're a few years old now, but absolutely top-notch. Now, a Sinister Grin press title that I would urge you to seek out is Mayan Blue by Michelle Garza and Melissa Layson. So, to finish, a quote from Allen Ginsberg. To gain your own voice, you have to forget about having it heard. Until next time, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great, great day. Particularly playing that original Resident Evil and the moment in the mansion when you're walking down the long, oh, the narrow dogs. corridor, and the, yeah, the dogs <laughs> jump through the window. Holy yeah. shit! <laughs> yeah, everyone can remember that bit. That's definitely up there. And you, you come back to the room later after you've completed the guardhouse section, and they've replaced the t- dogs with the biggest tarantulas, at <laughs> least at the time, to have featured in a game. So that that room yeah. was something terrifying. It was. And if I remember rightly, it happens kind of very early in the game too. So it was, it was a nice way of getting you to then think, you know, you didn't know what to expect at all from that moment onwards because, you know, you're, you're constantly then on the edge of your seat playing the game thinking, oh, God, what's going to happen next? What window's going to break? What yeah. one's going to drop down from here? It's, it's, it was Fantastic, love it. Yeah, I, well, I think it was the the second big kind of jumping moment of the game, with the first being when you encounter the first zombie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, feeding on your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A- after some brilliant dialogue that from slow Barry. That turn of the head, wasn't it? I know. Yeah. And it... Oh God! Yeah, the dialogue was fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Was that the game that had something like I was nearly a gerbil sandwich or something like that? Brilliant. I think some of it might have been lost in translation. That was a creative remembering, but it was you almost became a Jill sandwich. A gerbil a sandwich, sandwich, sandwich would have been even better because of how nonsensical. <laughs> so you've ruined my childhood memory there. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, was, was, <laughs> that was fantastic. That's all right. Yours makes way more sense. Yeah. Hence, I don't like well, it as much. In that scene, where the zombie starts to turn his head, they're probably, to me, one of the most iconic lines of dialogue. If I'm remembering correctly, you you go off with a lockpick while the uh, other non-player character gets to keep the gun. And so you, uh, I think you end up finding a gun right before you get that to that zombie scene. 
But, I mean, it's always I, it's been so long since I played it. I just remember that guy being, you know, here, take this lockpick. I'll I'll stand here. <laughs> and you're like going, no, I need I need something more than a lockpick. What am I going to do with a lockpick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That was just so they can get you to them back out of the room again, wasn't it? I think. Exactly. I think that, yeah. That's all. All it was was to get you out of the room. And if you searched around enough, you'd find something that you could use to fight with. But when you're first playing the game, you're just like, okay, this is stupid. <laughs> God, I wonder what it's like playing that again now. I bet my memories of it are all rose tinted. I bet it's terrible now. But it was brilliant back then. Loved it. Well, we're going to see it in January. <laughs> oh, yeah, the revisit would be great. They did remake it, I think. It was in the early noughties. Maybe it was about 2003, but they remade it for the GameCube. Oh, the original one. Yeah, oh, and nice. so it was quite it's quite a faithful remake, largely a graphical update. And I know that for both the PS4 and the Xbox One, you can buy a remaster of the remake. So, I mean... You said you had an Xbox, so if you want, yeah. you could pick up the remake and revisit it all over again. I might want to do that. It's like my fourth Xbox, but yeah, I might might have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I remember, remember correctly, too, they, they changed the controls on there, too, to where you didn't have like what they call the tank controls. You actually had more of a fluid yeah. Uh, you know, using the toggle controls too. I've never played it. I've wanted to. I just haven't. There's no time. Uh, <laughs> you really should, Bob. You definitely should. It's a very good remake. Check I remember one that scared the hell out of me. It was called uh, Ground Zero. And um, all you had in that was a camera. You had to take pictures of ghosts. It was oh, very difficult, oh. But it was Project terrifying. Zero. Project Zero. Project Zero. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Makes more sense. Yeah, that was brilliant. That was absolutely terrifying. I don't think I even finished it. It was that scary. I think that and um, one of the Aliens games that I couldn't do just because the Aliens scare me so much. So, mm. yeah, there's two games that defeated me purely because I'm a big wuss. <laughs> well, there, there's a few games where the player doesn't have a conventional weapon as such, so there is... Project Zero, where you've just got the camera, and it didn't get a wide release, but there was also Forbidden Siren, which was made by the developers of Silent Hill. And mo more recently, there's Outlast, which it was actually Bob who said that I had to play it, and essentially you're investigating a abandoned mental asylum and you're a paranormal investigator but the tagline is if you run into anything you either hide run or die and that's it <laughs> um, oh nice and i would say that it's the most terrifying game i have ever played and oh. you have to use night vision goggles for a lot of the darker areas in that asylum, but there's just a a sense of dread throughout, like something is going to happen. Just little noises, little hallucinations, and you're never quite sure, okay, is this something happening in the present and I've got to get out of here and hide? Or is this some sort of vision? And... It is so scary. Like I, I started playing it in Portugal when I was running the Sahara and teaching, and I was under a lot of stress. And I just thought, I can't play this game as well. It's gonna send my heart through the roof. I'm gonna actually have <laughs> some sort of heart attack. I need to play this when I'm in a better place. So, I need, I need to go back to that. But I see they've also released a demo for the sequel and in that one it's a classic american cornfield scenario where oh, nice. you're being chased by these different antagonists 
and again, you know, you've got no weapons, so they better not catch you. But one of my friends, he said he's playing the demo. In fact, it's Kev Harrison who writes for this as horror. And he said he played about an hour, but he now refuses to play the game without his fiance in the same room as him because it's just <laughs> too much. <laughs> That's how I am on the original Outlast. I've never finished it, and I will not play it by myself. Someone has to be here. This is a fantastic. And they, and they have to. Um, I, and they have to be awake. <laughs> In other words, like if my roommate, if my roommate goes to sleep, I won't play it. <laughs> That's one one for the Christmas list then, Ellie, from the sounds of it. Yeah, but Bob, when you recommended it to me. It was only afterwards that you really emphasized how scary it was. So I was like, oh, I'll just buy the game and all the expansion packs for it. <laughs> well, I've only played a few hours into the game. It was not it was not stated highly enough how difficult. Not because it's a hard game, but because, you know, you want to actually stay alive and not have a heart attack. Yeah, it- it's scary, and plus you have to eat. I mean, there's the, the puzzles are built around the the actual enemies, mm. so you have to remember and you have to use timing. Yeah, and things. and so and it's like it's they make these. I mean, it's really really uh, because it's like a puzzle. You have to figure out where this guy's going to go if he's going to walk here. How many times he walks over here before you can move ten feet, and you're like, God damn. <laughs> but yeah it, it's incredibly scary yeah i feel that we might take this audio segment and put it at the end as an outtake <laughs> because we have unwittingly done what bob and i did on a patrons only episode where we've accidentally started talking about video games and then just <laughs> ran with it for about 15 or 20 <laughs> minutes when it's meant to be a writing podcast but as you can tell we're, yeah, we're both very passionate about about right. video games and i mean before before this is horror long before this is horror i used to write a video games column for my local newspaper and then was the editor of the technology and video game section when I was at Warwick University. So this is an area I can just keep talking about. <laughs> oh, it's good stuff. It's influential. It's, it's crucial research for Rob. Exactly. And that was the, the original point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's they're so immersive as well, though. That, I don't know. You can read a lot of good parts. Horror, horror books, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's still, it's it's very hard to get past the words on the page part for me. Mm. Um, whereas once you're experiencing it, you know, visually everything like that. And if you like me, you do the room and you've got the headphones, then it's just fantastic stuff. It's good to feel that fear, and you can, in all honesty, you can then try and capture that again in your writing. I think maybe that's just you know self persuasion there, justifying another. F- few hours on the xbox in this case justifying me going out and buying out last now sounds brilliant that sounds perfect yeah yeah Yeah, the only thing i'd say is i mean now the the graphics are slightly dated and see you'll know you'll notice that but then (laughs) i'll give you half an hour for you not to be absolutely terrified so at first you might think oh the graphics aren't quite up to scratch, but half an hour in, you'll wish that the graphics were worse. 